Today on Newswatch, she's being accused of pay to play what Donald Trump is saying about new revelations on Hillary Clinton and what she did at the State Department. Plus, 100,000 missiles aimed at Israel. See what Hezbollah is up to in southern Lebanon and what Israel is doing about it. And grace, gold and glory, the strong faith of Olympic gold medalist Gabby Douglas. Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Donald Trump is taking Hillary Clinton to task for a new batch of emails he says expose her policy of pay to play at the State Department. The Clinton campaign is denying the charges. Heather Sells is on the story. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump is raising questions about a new email batch that contains fresh evidence that Clinton really Foundation like donors explain. got access to the uh, State Department while Hillary Clinton Chinese served as Secretary of State. Uh, the Clinton campaign I says Hillary Clinton anyone. never took action Who's because of donations you? to the Clinton Foundation, but the Trump campaign and Clinton critics say the emails show a pay-to-play approach to governing. What she did was so wrong, and she got out of it, well, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe there's more to come. Maybe there's more to come. But I will say this, what came out yesterday, reported today, right, pay for play. Call pay for, you're not allowed to do it, it's illegal. It's illegal. The Clinton campaign, meanwhile, is still attacking Trump, saying he was trying to incite violence when he said that maybe Second, well, Second Amendment people could maybe stop maybe Clinton a, judicial appointments. Words matter, my friends. And if you are running to be president or you are president of the United States, words can have tremendous consequences. <laughs> Yesterday, we witnessed the latest in a long line of casual comments from Donald Trump that cross the line. A new report on CNN shows that the FBI asked the Justice Department to investigate the Clinton Foundation earlier this year, but that the Justice Department refused. That could raise more questions about the impartiality of Attorney General Loretta Lynch, who oversees the department. The New York Times reported earlier this year that Clinton may keep Lynch as Attorney General if she wins the presidency. Clinton is also talking about the economy, saying she's going to bring back more jobs. In the first hundred days of my administration, we will make the biggest investment in new jobs, good paying jobs since World War II. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to invest in infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, our ports, our airports. These are good jobs, and a lot of them are good union jobs with good pay and good benefits for families. Today, Clinton will lay out her plans for the economy in a major speech, countering an economic speech that Trump gave on Monday. Heather Sell, CBN News. For many... The U.S. military's highest court has rejected the religious freedom defense of a Christian Marine who was punished for posting Bible verses. The court upheld the court-martial and dishonorable discharge of Marine Lance Corporal Monifa Sterling. She refused to remove a Bible verse she posted at her desk in 2013. Her attorneys argued her punishment was a violation of her religious freedom and a landmark case that could set a military precedent for decades. The bottom line is that service members shouldn't be punished for expressing their faith. We ask service members to do some of the hardest things in the world, and we shouldn't ask them to leave their faith behind, and we shouldn't punish them for expressing their faith in the workplace. The scripture posted on Sterling's computer and desk was from Isaiah chapter 54, which reads, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Canadian police say a man previously banned from associating with ISIS was plotting a suicide bombing. A police official say they thwarted the plans of suspect Aaron Driver, who was killed last night in southern Ontario. They say they were able to stop the possible attack after receiving credible information about Driver's plans. An investigation is still underway. The top U.S. commander says two years of bombing ISIS militants has reduced their numbers dramatically. Lieutenant General Sean McFarland says 45,000 ISIS fighters have been reduced to as little as 15,000 in Iraq and Syria. 
He says, quote, the enemy is in retreat on all fronts, but it is still difficult to verify accurate numbers. And other estimates put the number of ISIS fighters as high as 25,000. A family of eight has fled their homeland in Germany and is now seeking asylum in Russia. The Gerbish family set claims they are no longer safe under the, quote, German dictatorship. According to the Express UK, the family traveled some 1,400 miles to escape what they claim mass migration of, and lack of democracy. But Russia has refused to accept them as asylum seekers, claiming Germany is a safe country. For now, the family is relying on the goodwill of Russian people and legal technicalities to allow them to stay. Ties between China and neighboring Taiwan may now improve following Taiwan's recent presidential election. Some foreign policy experts believe cooperation between the two countries could help stimulate the world's economy. Meng Fali brings us the story from Beijing. Taiwan is on the move. As the country's first female president, Tsai Ing-wen is working to move the nation forward. During her inaugural address, she confidently encouraged citizens to believe her leadership will take the country to a new level. As the leader of this nation, improving the local economy tops my agenda. The goal is to shorten the wealth gap between the middle class and upper class. We will gain much when we work hard. As a Cornell University graduate, Tsai is planning to reform Taiwanese education. She says education is a top priority for Taiwan's millennials. Younger generations are the future of Taiwan. My teams are determined to provide all resources to equip them for leading Taiwan towards a brighter future. Believe me, higher education will change their lives. Beijing is pushing Taiwan to unify with China. However, experts say relations between China and Taiwan may worsen during Tsai's presidency. That's because the two countries have different political systems and economic policies. Tsai's predecessor embraced closer relations with China. Chinese President Xi Jinping recently confirmed the importance of unification, the One China policy. We resolutely oppose Taiwan independence, separatist forces. Over 1.3 billion Chinese people and the whole Chinese nation will never tolerate separatist activities against the country by anyone, at any time, or in any form. Dr. Minwan says Tsai's strategy to distance her country from China is less likely to be well received by other nations, such as the United States, South Korea and Japan. If the split between China and Taiwan really happened, it will create a dilemma for other nations, like the U.S. and South Korea, to make unwilling decisions. For nearly 70 years, China and Taiwan have functioned as two separate countries. President Obama believes unification could benefit the U.S. economy. And people from both nations believe the two countries should work closely for their mutual economic benefit. We interviewed several people on the street in Beijing. Because of the sensitivity of the issue, they asked us to hide their faces. I know before she became president, Tsai supported Taiwan's independence. However, I am certain she has changed her mind. Working with China closely elevates Taiwan's economy. For decades, it seems to me that China and Taiwan have walked over the same path, and we should keep it this way. Cooperation is always better than separation. According to the local press, President Tsai Ing-wen is scheduled to visit China this year. Chinese President Xi Jinping is looking forward to addressing many critical issues with the Taiwan's first female president. Mainly, she is hoping the leaders in Taiwan will continue to honor and understand the historical evidence. Meng Fei Li for CBN News, Beijing, China. Coming up, a look at Hezbollah's invasion of Israel 10 years ago. Find out why the wolf is still at the door and how Israel is preparing to meet this threat. Right now, the world is focused on Islamic terrorism from ISIS as a common enemy, but ISIS is only the latest in a long list of enemies dedicated to destroying Israel. That list includes Hezbollah, the terrorist group that went to war with Israel 10 years ago, and they could attack again at any moment. Chris Mitchell brings us the story. It's happened before. 
terrorists infiltrating Israel. That's why these reservists are training in northern Israel to prevent such an attack. We are training for a number of scenarios, scenarios where they're coming from the sea, air and land. Reserve Colonel Zvika Halperin, a home front commander, is responsible for the Western Galilee, an area with a population of 600,000. We're training the authorities for emergency situations, dangerous substance events, events where missiles fall, also from Lebanon, also from Syria, infiltrations of all kinds of forces. And in northern Israel, that's the Lebanese-based Iranian proxy, Hezbollah. So Hezbollah is vastly more powerful than in terms of its you know, core military capabilities, its missiles, its rockets, its ground forces, than are any of the other uh, Islamist militias which also wish Israel harm. Um, so Hezbollah remains the, you know, by far the main threat. Ten years ago, Hezbollah crossed the border, attacking and killing 10 Israeli soldiers and holding the bodies of two of them hostage for years. The incident sparked a war lasting 34 days. Middle East expert Jonathan Spire fought in a tank unit. He told CBN News Israel wasn't prepared. Many units, infantry units, armored units, went into the war having not uh, trained adequately in the previous years because they'd been very busy uh, fighting that insurgency in the West Bank and in Gaza. Hezbollah launched more than 4,000 rockets and missiles at northern Israel at a rate of more than 100 per day. That put a million Israeli civilians within range. Since then, the situation has worsened. A refortified Hezbollah appears stronger than ever and still wants to finish off Israel. We're talking about over 100,000 missiles that they have in southern Lebanon ready to be launched to Israel. We estimate that in any conflict in the future, 1,500 missiles a day will be launched. That's a real threat. Retired IDF Colonel Kobe Marom says Israel knows the missile locations, but in any future conflict, they will face challenges in attacking Hezbollah. They build their bunkers, tunnels, and missile sites under the civilian population, under hospitals, under uh, UN position, under schools, because they know when the pictures of the civilian death come to the people in New York City, Paris, or London, the game is over. That's why they use the life of their people as a tool in their struggle against Israel. That's the reality today in Lebanon. Marom says Hezbollah has obtained better technology and longer range missiles that can reach all of Israel. Plus, their numbers have grown from 7,000 terrorists to more than 40,000. They're also gaining a great deal of experience in areas of, of combat they didn't know about before, fighting in unfamiliar areas, fighting in urban settings, not stuff they've done before. Spire told CBN News that although Hezbollah is stronger, it's distracted by the war in Syria. Well, the thing with Hezbollah is that, of course, they are now bogged down in a very different war, not a war that they ever wanted. That's the war to protect Bashar Assad's regime uh, in Syria. Iran and Hezbollah support Assad because his country helps Iranian weapons make it to Lebanon. The bottom line is, for as long as the Syrian war continues, it is extremely unlikely that Hezbollah will be able to afford itself the luxury, so to speak, of hitting at Israel and opening up a second front against an enemy you know, vastly more powerful than the Syrian rebels they're currently engaged in, in fighting against. Spire says, fortunately, Israel is also better prepared. I think Israel is better prepared because I think the army underwent something of a, a change of focus following the 2006 war, understanding that Hezbollah is an enemy of a different nature, that Hezbollah is the main ground threat to Israel today, and that that requires an army, you know, effective and able to respond. And as long as Israel is not fighting in any regional conflicts, Spire says the main goal will be to keep its borders safe and prepare to take on any invaders. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Coming up next, they're bringing home gold again. Here the driving force behind one of America's Olympic darlings and her quest for grace, gold and glory. U.S. Olympians Ali Reisman and Simone Biles compete in the individual all-around gymnastics finals today. The two already helped their final five team win big in Rio this week. The U.S. women's team bringing home the goal. The three other gymnasts on the team, Gabby Douglas, Madison Koshin, and Lori Hernandez. It is a group that gives glory to God, saying, 
They rely on their faith in these high stakes moments. On Tuesday, the day of the big competition, Hernandez tweeted this Bible verse from Isaiah 40, 31. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. And Gabby Douglas writing in her memoir, Grace, Golden Glory, I take my Bible with me. I always pray at every competition. When the judges' hands go up, I am praying, and there are little scriptures I like to quote. Douglas made history in 2012 as the first African-American gymnast to become the individual all-around champion and the first American gymnast to win both individual and team gold at the same Olympics. She credits her success to her faith and the power of prayer. Like all Olympians, Gabby Douglas's road to the Olympics was paved with determination, hard work, and sacrifice. But it was more than that. Gabby's journey was laid on a foundation of God's word and prayer. If you go back on the like footage on like any competition, like you'll see my lips moving and I'm praying. And I remember when I fell and I'm like, oh, it's because I didn't pray. I, I fell because I didn't pray. I would, I would take it really seriously. She learned how to pray from her mother, Natalie. In fact, when Gabby was born, she was sickly and couldn't keep food down. Natalie, a mother of four, couldn't afford a doctor or medicine and had only one option. Literally, I just remember um, staying up at night, just praying over her and then just saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Then Gabby started gaining weight and became a healthy, happy baby. I mean, there's no other explanation as to, you know, how she miraculously recovered and, you know, just grew into the amazing, you know, strong child that she is. As Gabby found her passion in gymnastics, she spent hours in training, but it was expensive and Natalie couldn't afford all of her children's pursuits. Then Gabby's two older sisters decided to give up their activities so their sister could pursue her Olympic dreams. At first, Natalie wouldn't have it. How as a parent am I gonna allow my other children to give up their dreams and their passions just to help support the you know, dreams and passion of one? And I struggled with that for a long time. And, and it was my kids really that set me free. And they said, you know, mom, we want to do this. We want to see her achieve her goals. And we feel like we'll get there too. But right now, this is her time. Natalie knew the road ahead would not be an easy one. So she made prayer and Bible study a priority. Gabby says those foundations kept her on track in her most difficult times. I remember 2011 Visa Championships, and before that, I had hurt my hamstring. Well, my mom said, you know, when you're hurt, meditate. So I did, you know, kept quoting, you know, by a stripes, I'm healed. And then I went to the competition, and I did really bad. I remember walking back to the hotel room, and I was like, where was God? Like, why? I thought he, like, failed me. I'm like, where was he? He wasn't out for me. He wasn't there. And my mom said, you know, I don't know what happened tonight, but I know God has a plan for us. And then that year I made the 2011 World Championships and brought home a team gold medal. And I think at that point, my faith came into play. I really had to rely, um, you know, on the Bible and Jesus, you know, to bring me out of that hard situation, hard situation. That wouldn't be the last time. As the Olympic trials approached, Gabby moved to Des Moines, Iowa to train. But the long hours and time away from family were taking a toll. I got to a really dark place where I almost wanted to quit the sport of gymnastics right before the Olympic Games. And I said, you cannot quit. We've come too far. Too many people are on this journey now with us. So many people other than ourselves have sacrificed. I think that's when I had to rely on my faith the most. You know, I went to the gym and said, okay, if I'm gonna go to the Olympics, I'm gonna do it big. I prayed, meditated on scriptures, and um, I went back to the gym, and my coach said he saw this like fire in my eyes. With that, Gabby and four teammates won the U.S. championship to qualify for the Summer Games in London. Most didn't expect that Gabby, nicknamed the Flying Squirrel, would soon make Olympic history. Yeah, I did have a lot of doubters. They um, said, oh no, she's not gonna make it. She'll probably be mediocre, but not like on top. And I don't want to prove them wrong, but I wanted to prove myself right. I wanted to be like, no, I can do this, and I will do it. As the individual competition unfolded, Gabby rose to the top. 
Then in her final event, she clinched the gold. I lost it. It was this totally surreal feeling, like, is this happening? Can somebody pinch me? Can, can we make sure that this is actually happening? And then I thought about all the things we had gone through to get there. All of the years of sacrifice, all of the years of hard work and... Gabby earned another gold when she and the Fierce Five won the team competition. I mean, a lot of emotions. I was so happy and I finally thought it was all worth it. All the years of sacrificing, injuries, difficult times, tough times, it all paid off. I love gymnastics. I love, you know, competing. I love training. But after gymnastics, I don't know. I mean, the sky's the limit, so we'll see. The sky is indeed the limit. Gabby has added another gold medal to that American neck. We are so proud of her. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It is time now for your Thursday thankful, and I'd like you to join me in this prayer of gratitude. Father, I thank you for the gift of rest and refreshing. They make me even more grateful for your grace and your mercy. Both are new every morning, and they are both sufficient to carry me through the day's trials. With that word, make this a thankful Thursday. Remember, walking in gratitude will make any day a better one. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Make this a thankful Thursday. We'll see you right back here come tomorrow.